Welcome to the International Institute for Strategic Studies. I'm Ben Barry and I'm the Institute's in-house expert on land warfare. I run a program of events on land warfare themes and what I'm trying to do is promote better understanding and informed discussion of land operations and land forces. The Iraq and Afghan wars have been the major land conflicts of the first part of the 21st century and the UK was the second largest contributor of troops to both. Now, the wars have had profound effects at every level of the British military, from the personal equipment of the private soldier to the grand strategic and political. And the increasing difficulty and relatively, relative unpopularity of the wars coincided with unprecedented media interest, some evidence of high-level tension within defence and within government, together also with a renewed respect and affection displayed by the British public for its armed forces. Now, these phenomena weren't unique to Britain. Indeed, they occurred in Canada and the US. Of course, in the case of Iraq, we await what is potentially a comprehensive assessment of Britain's role in that war, presumably to be made by the Iraq inquiry when it reports. And of course, Britain's combat role in Afghanistan has 18 months still to run. But in all the extensive media commentary of the war in London, there's been comparatively little attention paid to the role of British military commanders the challenges they faced and the hard decisions they had to make. Now this has been addressed at Oxford by the Changing Character of War programme, who've been running a programme of talks and seminars by British commanders returning from operational theatres, which have explored these issues. And those events provide the basis for the chapters in the, books, in the book. Now those of you who aren't military professionals may not appreciate that sometimes command can be quite difficult to get right. Indeed, when you get it wrong, it's a, it's a sure route to subopt, suboptimal outcome. And sometimes the pressures on uh, higher commanders can be quite great. Again, something that, that isn't often covered. But our three panellists will provide some of their key insights from their um, experience and assessment, both of running the programme and of, of juggling with these very real um, high-level political and mi military issues. And that will be followed by uh, a discussion and a Q&A. Uh, the panellists will speak in order um, for 10 minutes each. The first will be Professor C. Hugh Strawn, who's the Chichley Professor of the History of War at All Souls College, Oxford, and also is a member of the ISS Council. Professor. Ben, thank you very much. Um, I see it as my job to explain how this book has come about. And one of the great things about this book is I've got my name on the title page, having done almost nothing else to put it together. Um, the, in 2004, um, the Leverhulme Trust was good enough uh, to give Oxford uh, a very large grant uh, to enable it to set up the Change of Character War program. And we were very keen um, that this shouldn't just be academic. Uh, academic incidentally is not a pejorative term, um, but it shouldn't just be academic, but that it should be uh, a mechanism for engagement with practitioners. Um, and at that moment, Jonathan Bailey um, was leaving the army um, and was anxious to do exactly that himself. Um, and together, uh, well actually very much Jonathan's initiative, uh, we, he offered to run uh, a series of seminars which he called Campaigning and Generalship um, and which he has continued to run until last year. Um, and many of you in this room have attended those seminars. Uh, unfortunately, many of those who have contributed to those seminars are here. Um, so the first person who deserves credit for this book is Jonathan. Um, his concern with, if you like, the post-Bagnell army, how it was engaging with the operational level of war, what that had meant, uh, particularly since the first Gulf War. So you will see the opening of the book is concerned with 1990s, with Northern Ireland, um, with Sierra Leone, with uh, uh, Kosovo. And then, of course, what we found from 2004 onwards was increasing engagement uh, with Iraq and Afghanistan. What we wanted to do in the, in the book was, and what the seminars were designed to do, was to engage not only with the army, but it is heavily dominated by the army, both as a book and also originally in the seminar series, but also with legal advisors, with political advisors, uh, with the Royal Air Force, um, and Ian McNichol has uh, contributed to this book, um, and uh, with, the, with the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines. Um, the pulling together of the book has been done above all by Richard Iron, 
um, who had a, uh, a stint as a defence fellow at Oxford um, and who has been, as most of you are here, here probably know, um, has been the principal driver in making sure that this book has actually finally come together. Um, the seminar series carries on, um, and actually my immediate neighbour, uh, Nick Parker, is taking over the running of the seminars uh, from next academic year, which is excellent news for us. Um, and so uh, you might just see this as a waypoint rather than a culmination of a programme. For me, one of, uh, and I'm a historian after all, I mean, I'm completely bogus when it comes to talking about current strategy. Um, for me, one of the really exciting things about the seminar series was it made me aware of the changing character of war. We had people coming back uh, straight from Iraq and Afghanistan who were talking about what they had been doing uh, two or three months previously, and it was different from what somebody else had said a year before. Um, and the excitement from my point of view as an academic and as a historian trying to keep track of um, how things unfold and how things change was that I was hearing this on the hoof, that it was coming, coming uh, straight from the horse's mouth before people really had had time to put any glosses on it, before people had time to see where it was going, before they had time uh, to indulge in, in hindsight. Um, Having said that, of course, one of the values of this book is not just what it should tell historians and one of the value of the, se the seminar series, but also how it points us in terms of lesson learning and looking forward to the future. Uh, there needs to be an opportunity to reflect on recent experience uh, so that uh, there can be some awareness and contextualization of that experience um, and a capacity to uh, digest and go forward. Um, I hope he won't mind me quoting him. He's not in the room, so he can't answer back. But Peter Wall said to me on one occasion, he said, one of the benefits of coming to speak to you lot is that I stop to think. Um, I'm sure he stops to think at other occasions too. But uh, the point essentially he was making was that coming to an academic context, having to reflect, uh, enabled him to give some shape to his experience. Um, some of you will know that this book was due to come out um, some time ago, um, and the reason for that has been that the Ministry of Defence has not necessarily shared our sense of the importance of that lesson learning exercise and aspect. Um, the, the, uh, the view taken within the Ministry uh, was uh, enormous readiness uh, to have, or not enormous readiness, but we certainly have full cooperation in terms of serving officers coming to speak. Um, rather different when it came to trying to turn those words into uh, a, the print, a printed form. Um, and uh, revision of the book, uh, but first of all, a delay, in, of course, in getting a decision out of the ministry. Um, and then, uh, after that loss of time, revision to the contents when certain people who had contributed uh, found themselves unable to do so uh, because they were still in uniform. One of the great benefits, of course, of the lapse of time is some people had retired by the time the book had come out, including CDS, uh, or ex-CDS, near enough. <laughs> um, you will find when you read the book that there are contro controversies within it, there are aspects that are controversial, there are unresolved controversies. It has not been our wish as editors to impose uniformity of opinion on here. Um, so there are parts of the campaigns that they discuss uh, where there are internal divisions between those in uniform in terms of how they see those. Um, and in particular, um, I think you will find the opening chapter by Jonathan Bailey, which sets the political context um, uh, irredeemably controversial um, and uh, uh, setting out uh, to be so. Um, if I have two overwhelming impressions both from the seminar series and from the business of drawing the book together, uh, they would be these. The first, and you might expect me to say this anyway, is that to imagine um, that we can somehow separate out strategy from policy uh, is complete fantasy. 
Uh, it may exist in the Huntingtonian expectation of how civil military relations should be done, um, but it doesn't exist particularly in the context of multinational operations in difficult political situations in other people's countries. Um, and that the relationship between strategy and policy has to be an iterative and ongoing one uh, which does not conform, as I say, to theoretical expectations, even if those theoretical expectations now occupy uh, some degree of acceptance, at least in the political space. And the second thing I would say is that the controversies around particularly Iraq and Afghanistan have tended, at least in the media, to focus on 2002 to three. Um, and those controversies are well known and well rehearsed, and of course the Shawcott Inquiry will return to them. What I find most uh, interesting in this book is what happened in 2006-07, particularly in relation to the British Army's own experience, particularly in the, at the point in Iraq uh, when uh, there was an appetite for withdrawal at the point that the United States was surging, um, and the point, of course, when Afghanistan was growing on the British horizon uh, at a stage when Britain was still engaged within Iraq. And particularly, of course, when the whole issue of where counterinsurgency thinking stood in relation to operations uh, was being explored and developed. Um, and if there is a moment, it seems to me, for self-criticism within the army, uh, it would be uh, precisely what happened in those years in terms of the coordination uh, of the response to those particular events. Um, two of the book's contributors are going to say a few words now, but what I would stress to you is that many of the other contributors to the book are here this evening, um, and there are also others in the room who contributed to the seminar series, but whose chapters and contributions are not in the book, very often because they're still serving, sometimes, of course, because they didn't actually wish to commit themselves uh, to the printed word, and sometimes because actually in the way in which the book was being shaped, their particular contributions didn't help in terms of the overall shape of the book. Um, but the two who are going to follow, uh, first of all, of course, Nick Parker, and second, Desmond Bowen. Thank you, Professor. I've had the privilege of actually working for both of the next two panellists. Uh, General Sir Nick Parker, um, has a background not just in Blair's Wars, but uh, Majors, Majors Wars and Gordon's Brown Wars as well, um, and David Cameron's security operations. Not only was he former deputy commander of coalition forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also has command experience from Northern Ireland, Bosnia and Sierra Leone, as well as spending much of last summer as the joint commander of the Armed Forces Support to the Olympics. General. Ben, thank you very much. Um, I've witnessed an extraordinary change throughout my 40 years of service because I, I cut my teeth in an army that was up to its armpits in the Cold War and Northern Ireland, uh, where the former taught us to understand mass and the latter gave us some tactical combat experience. We operated in a relatively contained environment where the proper fighting was conducted on maps we could remove the distractions and concentrate almost exclusively on an enemy that was made in our own image. I remember vividly cries like we trained down from war fighting, which was seen to be the most exacting environment at every level of conflict. Deterrence appeared to depend to a large extent on technological overmatch, and the warrior was the man leading the most tanks, and our plans for refugees and prisoners were simply incredible. But it was therefore a relatively straightforward environment. You knew where you were, and you thought you knew where things were going. And then after 16 years, the wall came down, and 12 years later, we had 9-11. And I believe that this changed my military life completely. The result has been that in the last 12 years of my service, that I have been provided with an extraordinary experience. I've learnt in that time more than I could ever have imagined in environments that I would never have predicted. I know that I have made mistakes which sometimes in the stark light of hindsight will appear crass, but I also think that I've learnt a huge amount and I now operate in a completely different way. My belief is that this book helps to illustrate the diversity of challenges that we have faced 
and how we have addressed them in our various ways. I'm no white or warrior, although I recognize the critical part that is played by those in that position. I do have considerable experience of making things happen through the strategic to operational interface, and it's from that perspective that I'd like to make three points. I've been struck how difficult it is to focus on the output or outcome in contemporary conflict. There is a friction between national objectives and the wider aims of a multinational, multi-agency coalition in an unfamiliar host culture. There is a tension between what is best for this complex collection of interests and domestic demands at home. I would illustrate this by the rather unhealthy British emphasis on Helmand, which has concentrated on the ebb and flow of a very difficult tactical challenge, while on the other hand, insufficient importance is given to the wider operational scene where the context is set and, in my view, the vital conditions for longer-term stability will be created in, in the case that I illustrate through reasonable Afghan governance. Now, this leads to my second point, that there is a real risk that those managing the national strategic interest will try to run the detailed tactical battle. I'm sure I don't need to explain to this audience how dangerous that can be. It results in extraordinary pressure on the tactical level commander who is unlikely to have either the staff or the experience to cope with this dynamic. It causes ruptures in coalition planning at the theatre operational level, detaching the tactical military fight from the multi-agency effort. And it undermines the chain of command, which is still such an impressive mechanism to deal with complexity, urgency, setbacks, and opportunities if it's trusted. So what? In the context of this book, I must emphasize the crucial role that I believe the general plays in bringing together all the strands at the tactical, at the theater operational level. And in doing so, brings order to those who operate in the tactical battle, which is just as exacting as it has ever been. And my third point, and I, I know that I risk hammering the nail out of sight, I want to emphasize the complexity of the contemporary multi-agency, multinational security challenges that we face. The military strand is by no means the most important, and nor is it decisive for the long term. But there will be moments when creating or sustaining a credible security foundation does require absolutely decisive action. I think that uh, Operation Mostarak in spring 2010 springs to mind as an example of this. It was Stan McChrystal's major effort to undermine the insurgency in the south of Afghanistan. It was a moment when the military line of operation was necessarily of a very high priority in order to set the conditions for others. But then as circumstances change, so other themes must take over if lasting human security is to be achieved. And I have to say that I think that more still needs to be done to identify where and when actors other than the military can play a decisive part. Economic development is key, and in this regard, sustained commercial investment, again in concert with the other lines of activity, has to be taken seriously. Development aid, in my view, can become a rather blunt tool as a campaign progresses, and encouraging international business to play an orchestrated and focused part in security has many virtues. So generalship in today's world is all about advocacy, influence, coordination, persuasion, and well-timed intervention. We need to be intelligent customers for other people's business. I've learned much about economics, rule of law, social care, Olympic sport, and for most of this, I have done it in very different cultures. I'm not suggesting in any way that I'm an expert, but I know that I have to work in very close concert with other equally important interests if we're to achieve our common goal. And at the same time, senior command still requires all those attributes of judgment, nerve, willpower, and leadership if the basic principles of tactical conflict are to continue to be applied properly. So for me, this book provides a really useful catalyst to promote and continue the debate. 
I don't agree with, anything, ever, with everything in it. Indeed, in a fast-changing world, I actually don't agree with everything that I did. But this emphasis, this emphasizes how important learning and therefore discussion are. I, along with Hugh, believe that this discussion should be, in a, uh, should be formed in an open debate, which includes all those who are operating across all the multi-agency and multinational functions, not just but including the serving military. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, we, we've really seen the perspective there from the theatre level, which in a sense is a focus of the military and the other uh, lines of action in a complex campaign like Afghanistan. But another focus at the national level is the interface between uh, senior officers, senior officials, and elected ministers, because ultimately the armed forces and all the other agencies of government are under civilian political leadership. And there's no one in London who, who has uh, more understanding of this than, than Desmond Byrne, um, a former Ministry of Defence senior civil servant with extensive experience in the operational policy area, which includes service in the Cabinet Office in the run-up to the Iraq War and spending 2004 and 2008 as the MOD's policy director. Desmond. Uh, thanks very much, Ben. Well, I'm an interested participant in this event, a contributor, but certainly not a general. Um, and as a contributor, I believe that there is a debate to be had about what the military can do, what they feel they should be expected to do, and what they are likely to be asked to do. So I too regret that officialdom has put contributions by serving officers off limits. It is their prerogative, but normally it's based on issues of security or willful challenge to political authority. And it's also odd in the light of the revelation, self-justification, and denunciation of some witnesses to the Iraq inquiry. Maybe that's part of the problem. Um, I've got three points that I think I uh, would like to make on this occasion. I don't intend to rehash um, the, some of the, uh, the, the lines that I have taken in the book about the, that political um, military interface at the strategic level. Uh, the first is to note that there is no unified military view on many of the issues raised, as Hugh has already said. The cry that politicians need only to listen to the military just does not hold up. Those who have written chapters in this book are talented and successful in assorted ways and are all strong characters with a sense of what should have been done, from mainly, it has to be said, the military perspective. I hesitate to put them in the same category as lawyers and economists, but no one should imagine that a single military view exists until, of course, the hierarchy asserts itself, and then it is the best judgment of the most senior officer. And if the prime minister wants to know what the military view is, having heard discord discordant voices elsewhere and within the military, he'll turn to the CD and that is the military view. My second point is that the views set out uh, here benefit, of course, from hindsight. And we've seen a lot of that on display, and clearly at the Iraq inquiry, but also in select committee sittings on Afghanistan. That's the nature of, of having inquiries. But for those who were part of the Whitehall machine in the 2000s, establishing what was going on, what to do next, was, re was rarely, rarely clear-cut. Above all, understanding when a threshold of a turning point was being reached, or the moment when a vital bifurcation in policy had to be confronted, may have been glimpsed, but often through a glass darkly. It's an interesting question how much clarity there was at the very time on big strategic issues, and perceived by whom and at what level with the added question whether an, an issue identified in theater was mangled on the way up through the chain of command. Finally, I was struck by the comment in one of the contributions that the Blair years had gone overboard on values and neglected to give emphasis to national interest. That sounds a bit like a plea for a return to the Cold War and the simplicity of the Falklands conflict. There may well be wars between sovereign states in the future, but much of what will perplex governments, as it's perplex perplexing government now, will be international terrorism, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, the consequences of climate change, resource competition, transnational organized crime, and internal strife overseas with baleful 
humanitarian impact, including in failed states. Now, these are big political problems involving global interests, including our own. And they won't go away, and they certainly are there in an interdependent world. Now, the military may well be required to play a part, often not the leading part, but an essential, usually subordinate one, in helping to get others to the point of political settlement, where a new and stable distribution of power can be achieved. So what I am arguing is that there will be more of this messy business with a strategy to deliver some sort of success falling a lot short of a neat Staff College answer. So this collection seems to me to be an invitation to a debate. And that debate should be conducted actively in-house within the military, clearly, but not just amongst the military, but by a wider community interested in how to grapple with the problems of the 21st century. Um, I, I, I don't know, um, I don't think the answer should be for the military to write themselves out of the script, nor to demand that they alone should set the terms. I was struck by David Miliband's Ditchley lecture the other day, when he spoke of failures that arise from over-reliance on military power and underinvestment in politics and diplomacy. The conundrum, it seems to me, is how to get that balance right when intervention is needed. Thanks very much. We've now got about half an hour for discussion, after which we'll be able to have a drink. Um, the, the rules of engagement here are pretty simple. Um, I'll throw it open to the floor in a minute. Uh, catch my eye, and I'll assign a roving microphone. Uh, if you've got a point to make, would you say mm. who you are and what organization you represent? And if you had a role in um, these wars, would you mind saying so? Um, so as to focus the discussion, I'd ask you to avoid uh, making general statements on the overall wisdom or legitimacy of the wars, because that's not really what the book or this event is about, but to concentrate really on the center of gravity of the book. That is the level of higher military command exercised by British oper officers um, on operations. Um, I also notice at least half a dozen contributors uh, to the book in the audience, probably more. Uh, between the panel, we all know who you are. <laughs> so if a question is asked that up here we feel we can't refer, uh, we might just bat it in your, in your direction. Um, the floor, uh, I'll open the event for questions or points, please. Stand, stand. At the back. I'll stand up. Nobody knows who I am. <laughs> yeah, I've been to Afghanistan and Iraq a bit. Um, I'm a member of the Institute, but I'm Robert Fox, Sub Defence Editor of the Evening Standard. Um, I'd like to take the learned professor up. Of course, the um, media asked around, didn't they? They didn't get it right. Gentlemen, that's where you lost the wars. You lost the war through the media. And we all like to kick our favourite journalists, and I think that this is where the problem lies. Now, I'll just split it as we've all done. Rule of three, I'll break it down. First of all, I think particularly in Afghanistan, this is striking. It was an incoherent campaign. You were trying to do three things, at least. Tony Blair was very keen that you do CN, counter narcotics, when, when you break out. 2002, the NATO agreement following Bonn. I don't want to go on at great length, but you were doing CT, supporting enduring freedom, and you were doing stability operations. And never for a sustained campaign from the very beginning were the resources available. And so we got John Lorimer and Mark Carton Smith, famous phrases about mowing the grass. Now you can't blame the media for doing that. At that point in that campaign, you lost the media. They didn't understand what the hell you were doing, why this was in the British national interest. I hop over the gate and go a little backwards as things evolved in Basra, likewise. When you were virtually under siege in the fixed points, downtown in Basra, and you were having an awful time, you were faced with uh, a tactical scenario, which very few grasped. You just didn't have the resources to match it. You were facing an insurgency inspired by Iran. 
and very serious, never gets written up this, by the way, who, who mentions the Garamsha? The very serious to organize crime battle. What did you have? 5,000 operational troops in a <coughs> municipality greater area of 2 million. That's the point at which you lost it. I'm going to come really forward. This is my question. It is a rhetorical question. Look at the fate of this book. And I agree, these things are infinitely of great value to people like me and not just anorexics like me. I think it should be in the public domain. What on earth is a government playing at where serious, thoughtful commanders have dedicated, who have dedicated their lives, their career, their reputation, and very often their families to this? That it's pas avant les pas avant les les enfants. Don't do it in front of the children. It shouldn't be discussed. I think, and this is, a, I, I speak with measured rage about this, after 47 years in journalism, being decorated in a battle at Goose Green, that the government general ethos of approach to discussion in the public media about such vital matters of British and collective security, I think, is an absolute scandal. While I could point the fingers I have done now, I praise you all for producing this book. It is very important. Thank you very much, Robert. So the centre of gravity of what you were saying is you'd like the panel to talk about the difficulty and challenges of getting handling the media right in these very difficult circumstances. Who'd like to start? I look quickly to my side. I think Nick's had to do this more often than my <laughs> Yeah. Um, thanks, Robert. <laughs> used to bang on an HCSC as well. Um, I, I do think it's a very important point. I think it's uh, fr from the perspective that I would speak, which is at the theatre operational level, uh, it, it was much easier for me to talk to the media as a NATO officer. Uh, and indeed, uh, it was necessary as a NATO officer to, to have regular conversations with the international media. I found it it much easier to talk to uh, organizations in the States or in Europe than I did to the British media. Um, and that was largely because there was, there was a nervousness reflected up the chain of command about things that one might say. Now, I, I have one, I mean, I, I think we, too, we do talk too much sometimes uh, and I absolutely recognize that when you're stuck in Kabul, it is very difficult sometimes to understand the nuances that are going on back at home. And I have one example um, where I think we probably caused more damage than good. Uh, when I was in Sierra Leone, uh, there was a very important link between London and New York, um, diplomatic link to the UN. Uh, which was trying to create conditions with the UN that would allow us to have a proper relationship with UNAMSIL. And I inadvertently made remarks to the media which were entirely justifiable from a theatre perspective, which caused real tension because of the way that they were presented in the media back in London, and real tension in the relationship between New York and, and London. And Inadvertently, I did real damage to the strategic conditions that were being set in order for me to be able to do the job that I was doing in the theater. And therefore, I think if you, if you want to have a really informed view on this, and there, I think there are two, two separate issues. There is this debate, which I think should be open and should include people who are serving. But there is also controlling the message, managing the message sufficiently well to make sure that the story is properly told to the media in a way that allows you both to tell the right story and to do your business. In order to do that, I think you need to people, talk to people who deal with the media at the strategic level. Uh, and I'm not in the position to do that. Thank you for that very frank response. Desmond? Uh, yeah, I'd just make uh, two comments. I mean, one, um, I mean, the, the charge, Robert, of, of incoherence. I mean, the fact is that um, most undertakings uh, by way of um, interventions don't deal with one single thing. I mean, there are, there are going to be 
different strands that need to be woven together. So, um, you know, maybe the, you know, how the message was put across, you know, politically here or militarily in theatre, um, you know, added to the inco incoherence that you felt and you saw as a, a correspondent. But, I mean, I think we have to um, accept that it is very unlikely that you're going to be able to do a single thing um, in the operation that you're under, undertaking and confine it to that. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a bit like, well, I mean, certainly, you know, political campaigns when you're, you know, trying to get elected, um, I mean, the argument is, you know, you have the same message and you give the same message around every street that you go. It's no good changing the message every time. And yet, that doesn't give a comprehensive idea of what a policy might be. But the second point, and which is, in a way that, you know, it seemed to me to be, um, you know, really rather more important, and that is that this is ultimately all about politics and a political settlement. Um, and one of the real difficulties and the challenges is that the time frames that the military frequently work to, I mean, there's an impatience to get on, to do things, to fix things, but politics doesn't keep pace. Politics operates at a different level. I mean, I remember talking to Graham Lamb, and I said, you know, you know sometime in the middle 2000s, why is it that in, in Baghdad, you know, politics, they aren't sorting things out? And he said, well, you know, they're doing politics 24 hours a day, and, you know, but they still aren't making settlements. And those settlements actually didn't come until very late. And in fact, they haven't really even come now. So the, the, as it were, the political stream and the arriving at a political settlement is operating, it seems to me, uh, on a different time frame and a time continuum from the kind of activity and effort that goes in at the military level. And trying to harmonize those things is really complicated. And I, you know, frankly, we haven't managed to do it. Hugh, have you got anything to add? I, 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 I think we should go on to another question simply because I'm not ha saying anything particularly coherent. But I, I would, I suppose, I, I would make have two reactions. One is that, in a way, Robert, what you're reflecting is the t challenge of finding coherence in these campaigns, anyway, uh, precisely because uh, we're dealing with, you know, we're, this is in many ways a, a, we're presenting this as a British story, uh, but it's not a British story, is it? I mean, it's a story that involves. Uh, the countries within which uh, the British Armed Forces have been operating in conjunction with allies um, and as a junior partner to a much more significant military partner. So the coherence at a political level um, hasn't even been within the gift of London, even if London has at times acted as though it was within London's gift. And it seems to me that tension inevitably has produced incoherence um, and, of course, that has been the prime challenge, to find coherence there. And what has happened at the military level has been, you know, the, the, the equally natural response, which is, what is our comfort zone? What do we do well? Um, the answer is we do the tactical and operational side of it well. We, can, we, we know how to do that. And so you have, you, we've had this discordance between um, a, a, a tactical and operational solution to a set of problems, many of which have been successful within their own terms, but without a context uh, in political terms, because that has been so much less coherent. It's really a, a, a recalibration of what Desmond's just said, um, that actually this has been inherently very, very hard to achieve. But even in saying that, in identifying the problem, perhaps that is at least part of the answer. I mean, one of the things I'm very fond of saying is if we don't ask the right question, we won't get the right answer. And, and, and you know, it does seem to me that that is very much been heart of, a part of the answer. Uh, but it is precisely why, of course, the point I made earlier, why when people are dealing with operational uh, uh, and even possibly tactical uh, problems, they find themselves stepping into a political zone uh, almost inevitably. At the back, Sir Kevin Tevitt. Uh, thank you. I'm Sir Kevin Tibbet, uh, former Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Defence and uh, a witness to some of the events which are being discussed. I wonder how important you would say our relationship to the United States was, not just at the political level, which, you know, history will be very clear about Blair's relationship to the United States, but also at the military level. Uh, I say that because thinking of what Robert Fox had just said, I mean, one of the reasons that we grappled with the problems of the three objectives in Afghanistan, forgetting Iraq, of counter-narcotics, of 
counterterrorism and of stabilization was that the British view was that we uniquely were in a position to bring together those three missions by providing the command structure for Afghanistan and taking responsibility in Helmand. We had the aspiration as Britain, of the only country, I can see uh, Desmond Bowen looking away at this stage, we had the aspiration of being the only country who could do this. Nobody else could bring together the NATO mission and the United States mission. Nobody else could bring together the American ambition in Iraq and the NATO objective in Iraq. This obviously was, if you might say, a rather grand, grandiloquent view of the British political establishment. I wonder how far you think that this may have influenced the views of military men as they went about their job, either wanting to impress the United States, feeling that they were perhaps even better than the United States of certain things, or certainly wanting to go shoulder to shoulder with them. How far was that dimension possibly coloring actions which may, with the benefit of history and hindsight, have possibly been a bit too much for us to bear given our financial situation and our capabilities. Thanks for that very stimulating question. Would anyone like to tackle it? Should I start from a military perspective? Um, i just make two, two observations which don't quite answer the question, I don't care. Um, the first, I went to Baghdad in 2005 with a very clear view of what I thought the American military were. Um, in fact, I characterize it subsequently with lectures I gave in the States with a picture of John Wayne. Um, and that, and that, that there is an element of truth in that, 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 that we were going to provide the intellectual stimulus for this brutish organization that, that, that had huge mass, but not an awful lot of sort of fancy footwork. And I learned very quickly in Baghdad by being bunged in at the theater level that they had, they, it, it is an extraordinary organization. They had the ability to learn, in my view, more quickly than we did. Uh, okay, because they could throw resource in a way that we couldn't, but they, they were prepared to risk an experiment and, and they were prepared to take it on the chin. Bugger me that they take some hits. And they didn't, at my level, flinch, and yet my experience was that there was a rather precious operation going on, if you'll forgive me, but a rather precious operation going on in Basra, which was subtle and fleet of foot, but didn't really like getting knocked terribly hard. So I, uh, my experience in Afghanistan, in, in, in Iraq, led me to develop a deep respect for the tactical and operational ability of the American military. Uh, my second observation is that um, I think, and David will, well, may, may, I don't, may disagree with me, but I think that the operation in Afghanistan it, up to, 2000 and to, to February 2010 was essentially a consensual coalition operation where you were limited by the resources that each nation was prepared to put into the operation. And when the Obama surge gave McChrystal the opportunity to have a plan that took the initiative wherever he chose to in the whole of Afghanistan, suddenly we got military, operational, and tactical uh, initiative. We, we regained the initiative. Now, we, we could not have done that yeah. without the American resource. So uh, there was a risk, and, and a, a genuine risk, that the British would stand there in central Helmand like a traffic cone in the middle of a motorway with the traffic flowing past it. But we were able to persuade, a little, little bit of negotiation, but we were able to persuade the British to get involved enough to be a com comprehensive part of the operation. And then, in those circumstances, I felt that the British and Americans worked really well as tactical and operational partners. But we were reliant on US resource. Well, Kevin, you, I mean, to some extent, you, you, um, you pose the question, but you answer it yourself in terms of particularly in, in relation to um, going to Helmand and what the purpose was. I mean, the fact is that there was you know, a, a divided command. The Americans were doing um, counterterrorism, um, and they were operating around the country. 
Um, and NATO was trying to do a different sort of operation, which was more related to counterinsurgency, which um, was where um, the Secretary of State at the time uh, found himself making statements about not wanting to fire a shot because he was trying not to say that that's what would happen, but that there was a, a difference between undertaking stabilization operations or counterinsurgency operations and, and undertaking um, counterterrorism. So, I mean, in just in straightforward strategic terms and military folk, let alone civilians, could see that this was a pretty odd way of running a campaign. Um, but also, you know, there was a request from the Afghans. I mean, surprise, surprise. I mean, people talk about invasions and, you know, the West asserting themselves. Actually, the Afghans wanted some support. I mean, the Afghans, in the shape of the properly constituted government, said, PRTs are doing some useful work in the north. Can't we have them sp spread around the country in a you know, sensible and coherent way and provide that kind of support? And, you know, yes, I think the UK did. I mean, maybe the UK felt they were the only ones who could do it. Maybe we felt that the Americans were the, would trust us and our admirable commander of the Ark, who was going to go, um, to do this job um, and, and actually not just do it ourselves, but to bring others with us. So, I mean, I think there was a sort of level maybe of strategic ambition and, and self-congratulation that was excessive, but actually I don't think it was anybody else who was going to stand forward to do that. Was it the right thing to do? I mean, certainly there were, you know, there were problems, but I don't, you know, there's, there is a question as to whether the right outcome would have been to have a decently prt north and we could forget about the south. I mean, some people have argued f uh, for that, and I think Blackwell has, has you know, gone into print and said maybe we should just sort of divide Af uh, Afghanistan in two. Well, I don't think so. Um, certainly that wasn't the political judgment of the time. So there was maybe a, you know, a level of, uh, of um, a strategic ambition and a, and a sense of how a campaign should be undertaken you know, which maybe didn't, you know, pan out in exactly uh, the way that we expected. But, you know, as I have said in this book, I mean, you know, when the military turn up and find that it's a bit different, you know, that's normal business. I mean, you can't see over the, the hill in front of you, so you adapt and actually usually ask for more resources, which is uncomfortable, certainly for politicians. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just make a very quick observation about the composition of the book in answer to that question, which is, if you think about the narrative that this 20 years covered in this book uh, embraces, it is the story of moving from British-led operations to multinational operations as a norm. Um, and so, you know, Northern Ireland's there at the beginning, um, Sierra Leone, uh, maybe there with other guys as essentially British-led operation, to being in a very different situation. Um, and you know, obviously we have struggled to come to terms with that in all sorts of ways. Uh, one in particular, I remember, and I won't say where I was lecturing, but in 2004-05, talking about strategy, and in what should have been and was a pretty well-informed audience, and they all turned around and said, well, that's not our responsibility, is it? Because that's the Americans' job. Um, and it was as though we'd sort of had a complete flip in our own thinking at that moment because it wasn't our show and we were there for other reasons. Um, and I, you know, precisely what that means in terms of lessons learnt and where we're going uh, seems to be really quite important apart from the, the, you know, the need to regain the capacity and I think uh, we are actually regaining the capacity to think about those things. We do recognise that particular uh, loss of, if you like, of confidence. Um, but I think that is one of the virtues and I, I'm saying it partly so you don't ignore the first 10 years that are covered by this book because of the last 10 years. Uh, time marches on. I don't want any bubbles to go flat. I think I see three more questioners. Could you please um, make your points very brief and we'll take you in succession and then the panellists can choose to take uh, whatever aspects you raise they want. Uh, first, General Newton, by the camera. Thank you. Uh, Paul Newton, University of Exeter, author of Chapter 25, if you have that amount of stamina. Uh, <laughs> my question really, as we're being introspective, is about the quality of military advice, following on from Kevin's point. Uh, in the 1990s, I became aware of this idea of politically informed and politically aware military advice. And some of us were very uncomfortable with some of this advice. The notion in Iraq, for instance, of overwatch, which is a nonsensical piece of military advice, but it was politically expedient. Do you think that we have, um, how will history judge the military advice given by our generation? And I think Tim Ripley is a couple of rows back in the blue shirt. Um, raising the point that, I'm uh, oh, sorry, Tim Ripley, uh, journalist, I spent uh, many uh, 
hours listening to <coughs> MOD briefings in Northumberland Avenue before the war at Qatar in, in CENTCOM and in Basra. And I had heard a posse of senior generals, military officers, enthusing about the war and why it was a good idea. Um, and this raises the point Robert made about lots of those enthusiast, enthusiastic sort of support for the war from the senior military officers proved to be incorrect. They were, in positive you could say they were spin, but uh, you could also say they were deliberate lies. Um, is there a way that we can regain the trust in our, in our senior military leadership? For example, when they appear before House of Commons committees, they swear an oath to tell the truth. And also, some sort of um, requirement that they are not to participate in um, political propaganda um, on behalf of the government. Well, that's a searching question. And there's a gentleman right over in the corner in a white shirt. And I'm afraid we'll have to draw stumps after this person. Um, Mike Shearer, I was the, the spokesman in Iraq for a period of time, uh, 0708, uh, really for the general, uh, General Nick. Um, I think that people often lose the sight that the British military are in an extraordinary, unique, and difficult position because our Commander-in-Chief is Her Majesty the Queen, not the Prime Minister. So unlike the Americans, when the American generals get up and speak, they are immediately inside the, the OODA loop of, the, of their political master. And so at, at many levels, uh, the military, the generals, are hemmed in in trying to remain apolitical. I'd just be interested uh, on General Nick's take on that. Well, I think that's the first time in my two and a half years at the ISS as anyone's mentioned the Queen in any of our events. Um, gentlemen, any, any responses to any of those three um, very wide points? Well, uh, um, I, I, I think that my general response to all of them would be to pick up something Desmond's already said, which is the presumption that somehow there is a uniform military view here um, as opposed to uh, a uniform other sort of view. And that's partly addressed to, to your question, Paul. I mean, how will, the, how will, will this be judged? After? When I, you know, I'm a First World War historian who strayed into this by accident. And one of the things that strikes me most about the First World War generals is you know, there is a, a sort of frocks versus brass hats polarity. It's not like that. The way in which the war is conducted is generals, I mean, it's absolutely Desmond's point, some generals have one set of views and some generals have another set of views. They're intelligent, uh, most of them, uh, intelligent, uh, uh, reflective individuals. And equally, politicians, of course, also have different views and will respond accordingly to the generals they speak to and the, con the, the conversations they have. So we have a, a theoretical constitutional expectation, which, of course, is absolutely part of where the Queen comes in. Um, but um, we, we have a much more complicated position. And my concern throughout this, and I, 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 forgive me this because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of standing back from the three questions, my concern about this is that we have, um, th we've lost sight of the reality because we've become sort of hung up on what we think is the theory of civil military relations and in being unable to recognize the reality have started to act out of the theory and that is what has created confusion for us. Instead of seeing that what we're actually talking about is a bunch of individuals, many of whom, of course, have different trainings and different expectations. You know, the argument that soldiers naturally plan, that is what they do. Uh, they think in the longer term. They want clear direction. I mean, all that is perfectly true. Uh, but at the same time, to imagine um, that this produces a uniformity of plan and a uniformity of expectation as opposed to where the politician is seems to me to be cloud cuckoo land. I think uh, the, the quality of military advice, I think, and it goes back to a point that David's already made. If your theater level commander or representative is included in the strategic discussion, which was not the case early on, then at least you get the ability to present your view to the, those who sit at the strategic military political interface. And in those circumstances, you, you, you state your case as vigorously as you need to, and you know that you've got it to a level where the decision is being made. My, my personal frustration was that it was bloody difficult to do that. And, and shifting 
this, this very important discussion at the operational level right into the heart of the decision making, I don't believe always happened because I, I wasn't present on each weekly conference and I didn't have a, a reasonable dialogue with the strategic military uh, commanders. Um, I think the second two points can be put together. Um, I mean, the first point I have to say, because I, war, war security operations are bloody. Um, I feel deeply about the human cost of what we do. Enthusiastic military d a desire to intervene must be tempered by an understanding that you, you are doing something which has pain associated with it. Now, that doesn't mean that your decisions should be affected by that. You just need to recognize it. Um, and I certainly think back over certain weeks in Sangin in 2000, spring 2010, when there was a need for all of us in the chain of command to hold our nerve in a way that was very countercultural when you were thinking about the human sacrifice that was being paid. But the, the, the business of politics and, and being apolitical, I, I don't think that's as much of an in issue as you may have suggested. I, I think it's, I, I personally believe it's a great pity that certain retired, serv uh, retired officers have declared their support to a particular party because I think that tars all of us with some sort of political association. I think, I think we have a duty to be apolitical while we're commenting on the, the business of security. Um, and I, f I was quite taken aback the other day when I was talking to some people who assumed that I was a conservative supporter because that is what they think Melchit and Mannering are. Um, I, I think we, we have a responsibility to remain apolitical while we comment on this. I mean, I'll, I'll say three quick things. I, I mean, I didn't really understand the, the last point made, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, the military are servants of the state. I mean, you know, yes, um, the, the queen is the commander in chief, but they are the servants of the state and the constitutional settlement. That's how it, it, it works out. Um, the, um, the question about, you know, telling the truth, well, you know, there are 115 different truths. I mean, you know, I mean uh, Tim, you, you, I mean, you know that well. I mean, uh, but the difficulty is that people in theatre have a task, they have um, some objectives to achieve, they've got some ideas of how they want to do it. They get, you know, they're very unlikely to say, um, well, I'm not sure, this is all very difficult, and you know, I'd like to go home. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's just not the animal that is the mm -hmm. British um, you know, general, let alone you know, army officer. So, I mean, you, know, you just have to live with the reality of that, um, and you, you know, journalists will challenge whether they're doing sensible things or not. But I didn't, I, you know, the idea that there's a, there's a I mean, I, I said in my piece, finding out what was going on and what was really going on and where the decision points when you're on the threshold of a decision point is extremely difficult. And actually, one of the most valuable things um, that, you know, we can have in terms of, you know, our perception and understanding in Whitehall is to be able to stand back and make those judgments about this being a crucial moment that we must... You know, take seriously and maybe you know stop and stare a moment while we consider it. And you know there are moments like you know the idea that we should send the Ark to um, Iraq in 2004. I mean that was a you know clear big strategic decision from which the government stood back and said no, we're not going to do that, but we'll send it to Afghanistan instead two years later. I mean you know there was a decision of that sort. But so you know, just occasionally it's very clear, but an awful lot of the time just understanding the truth is um, not, uh, I think, a very you know, easy idea. Um, secondly, uh, thirdly, um, the politically aware um, military advice. I mean, you know, I'd, um, I mean, I just sort of recount a tale. I mean, I remember in 2001, um, at the political level, the question was asked, what would it take to secure Kabul because we now have a bond conference and we have the prospect of 
um, some kind of stabilization force. The Americans didn't want to do it. They were too busy doing things in the mountains. Um, and eventually they said to the British, uh, would, could you maybe take this on? And the question was posed to the Ministry of Defense, what would it take? And the answer was, and Simon Williams is here, was 70,000? 70,000 troops to secure Kabul. And that's a probably a, you know, an absolutely sort of proper military answer. In the course of the Bonn conference, the Afghans said, we are not going to have anybody else providing our security. We're a sovereign state. We're going to look after our security ourselves, thank you very much. So, but we might not want a security assistance force. So you move from 70,000 to 5,000 you know, in one easy move. Now, and now What's that? Is that politically aware advice? Is that you know, a sensible way of responding to the, you know, the, the problem? You, know, you send a general to make a, an assessment of whether you can actually do something useful in stabilization in the short term. John McCall, and you know, he, makes, he comes back and says, yes, I think it's something that we could do. Um, there are risks, but it's manageable. And, and was it a sensible thing to do? Yes, it was. Was that politically aware advice, or was that rash kind of, you know, military advice that had been um, somehow improperly um, uh, sort of macerated in a sort of political mess. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be as, clear, as sort of critical as you appear to be about that difficult you know, judgment uh, that has to be made. Well, thank you very much. Um, we've had an extraordinarily rich diet here. I mean, it's, re it's really had a very high fiber content of insights. And I'm sure that as you go through the book, you'll find an awful lot um, to take away and ponder on, which also the next generation of commanders might well l learn from. Um, I've got a number of concluding remarks I must make. The first one is that the point that, that, that General Parker made about the human cost. Tomorrow lunchtime, we're running an event entitled The Revolution in Battlefield Medicine and Healthcare for the Wounded, which of course will emphasize how some of that human cost has been alleviated and the extraordinary advances that have been made, if you like, are one of the silver linings of the cloud of wars of 9-11, uh, both in the UK and US. And um, Brigadier Chris Parker of the Royal Army Medical Corps is going to talk about that tomorrow. We've also got an event um, on Tuesday, the 30th of July, um, where Dr. Vonda Felbab brown from the Brookings Center is coming to talk about the Gordian knot of organized crime, violent conflict, and human security. That's something that we certainly saw in uh, the Balkans, Sierra Leone, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Um, and if any of you want to attend, uh, it's easy to find the events on the ISS website and, and register your interest, interest there. Um, the publishers are outside with a table groaning with copies of the book, which for tonight only are being sold at 10 pounds instead of the list price, uh, 1999. Um, so you can purchase it at a discount without having to contribute to Amazon's uh, profits and tax. Um, and for those of you who want to stay, there are drinks which have been very kindly fu pu uh, funded by the publishers and by the Character of War program. But would you join me in showing appreciation to the speakers for a fantastic insight? <laughs>